six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother. <clears throat> he led them up on a mountain, high mountain, by themselves. And as he was transfigured before them, his face shone like the sun. And his clothes became what? Can you read out and loud? His clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Then Peter answered and said to him, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, do not be afraid. And when they lifted up their eyes, who did they see? They saw no one but Jesus only. Amen. We will focus on that in a couple of other verses. We've been doing a series of teaching about walking in the glory of God. In the last uh, two weeks, I spoke about the glory can be seen. Amen. The glory is what? Visible, can be seen. Now, ushering in the glory of God is something that is amazing. Anytime we preach and teach about something, it will happen. Amen. Preaching is a method God has used to bring people to the reality of the word of God. Are we together? And so we today are going to move a little bit in and bring a word of God that he's put in my spirit uh, on the greater series on the same theme of glory. But in the direction that God is not very happy that his glory seemed to have left today's church. And God wants the return of his glory. When we say church, we're not talking about just the general congregation. You and I are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are the church. Amen. Say, I'm the church. You remember when we were in primary school, they used to draw on the blackboard, the rectangle, and then a triangle, and a cross on top of the triangle, and two little tumundus running to the church, saying, let us go to the church. Wrong theology. You and I are the church. We don't go to church. We are the church. Now, but the glory seems to be departing from the church, if not departed. What we have today is religion, way, tradition, no more things. And so I come here today with a very heavy heart to make a prophetic call for a return. For a return. So that the glory of God can come in. Before I showed in Matthew chapter 3, before I comment on this, Romans chapter 3, sorry, verse 23, I told you, show you th three scriptures just to link from where we're coming from to where we are going. This is what Romans 3, in fact, this Romans 3 is running all the way from Romans chapter 1. The last verses of chapter 1 showing how man has exchanged the glory of God even to practices that are detestable and the whole aspect of uh, men becoming so corrupt, having reprobate minds. And the law can't help, religion can't help. So, for all have sinned. And what has happened because of sin? And fall short of the glory of God. Sin causes God's glory to stay very far away. What is sin? Sin is missing the mark. In the Greek word, is missing the mark. Missing what God had Required missing his righteousness, missing and rebearing and 
missing the target. Now, so sin causes a diminishing of the glory of God. Now, if you throw your mind to the Old Testament, you can remember God walking with his people. Amazing things happening. In fact, some of the miracles of the Old Testament were so glorious that they have not even been repeated. That they, like the separating of the Red Sea. It was so amazing. We haven't had any African river so far separated. Which was a demonstration of God's glory. But when we were studying this and teaching on this, we went to Haggai showing how the glory of God is going to return. So let's go to Haggai, remind ourselves the second verse as we look at where we are coming from, where we're going. Haggai, some of the prophets of old, chapter 2, verse 3. This time Haggai and their people have returned from Babylon. They are back home. In chapter 1, they had missed uh, direction. They had lost direction. They were building their own houses. They built nicely, paneled homes, and uh, they neglected the house of God. So what did the prophet say? Consider your ways. He said, go to the forest and cut timber. Let's rebuild the house of God. So in this verse, uh, they are standing on the debris of this ruined city, and they are looking at how things used to be. Who is left among you, they say. Who saw this temple in his former glory? And how do you see it now in comparison with it? Is, it? is this not in your eyes as nothing? Indeed. Hold on. Uh, this temple, the way it used to be, the old man, they look at the experiences past. They look at how the temple looked like. They remember the golden uh, golden overlay over the wood, the beauty. You remember the Ethiopian queen had gone to see Solomon and had seen the glory, had seen how it was, it had great splendor. Now, Nebuchadnezzar came and destroyed this thing. You know, uh, when these people are taken away, look, it looks bad. What do you see it now looking like? How is the church now when you look at the church? Some of you have no historical record of how the church was in this nation. Some of us who are remnants of the, of the old have a, a little clue and a little idea of the kind of power and glory we saw in the church which seem to have been lost. Today we have something different. I don't know what this is. Now, so here they are comparing. Jump to verse 7. Hear what the prophet says. The prophet says, uh, in the process of restoring the glory, he said, I will shake all nations. And they shall come to whom? To he who is called the desire of all nations. You can see the cups there. That's Christ. It's a prophetic picture of Christ. And I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. That's good news. Someone say that's good news. Yeah, God will do what? Fill the temple with what? With glory. So God promises he will do something. Amen. He will do something in our time. Every generation of saints will see the glory measured out for them by God. That's a very serious statement I just made. Every generation will be given an opportunity by God to experience a dimension of glory. Oh yes. God will have to rewrite your history. God will release such glory, you'll have something to tell your children. I tell you the truth. Something is going to happen. Now, it all begins with shaking. Somebody say shaking. God is shaking nations. God is shaking the church. God is shaking families. Turmoil. There's sifting. You know, there, is, there are shake-ups. You know, some nations cannot hear Unless there is a catastrophe. I'm not calling for any danger. But they will be shaking. Hebrews chapter 12 talks about shaking. God shook the heavens. And he will also shake the earth. And the purpose of shaking. Is so that those things that can be shaken. Will be shaken away. 
false religions will be shaken away divination and witchcraft will be shaken away materialism and prosperity strange things will be shaken away so that that which is the kingdom will remain praise God then the people will begin to desire him who is called the desire of all nations then God will fill the house with glory now God will fill our lives with his glory amen Anytime you see a sift, not shift, but sift, S-I-F-T. Every time you see a shake up, every time you see, listen, every time a tree is shaken. Trees are shaken so that ripe fruit, by the way, can come down, can fall. So not every shaking is bad. The shaking of a tree also can cause the dead branches and leaves and that which should not hang in there to also go. May there be some shaking. Shaking, glory to God, to remove that which is not necessary or to release the best fruit. So not every shaking is bad shaking. It's part of the process of preparing the glory to return. And that's going to happen to this church, to the body of Christ. That's going to happen to this generation. Hallelujah. So, then the next verse, 8, God says, because glory can be seen, he talks about silver and gold are mine, uh, says the Lord. Because the, this will be part of the materials that will be used to restore the glory. People will give, people will uh, uh, provide so that the house of God can be built. Here the scripture is talking about a physical temple, praise God. God will use anything to restore his church and to restore brothers and sisters in the Lord. Uh, individually or corporately. Then he says in verse 9, Haggai is a prophet, says that the glory of uh, this latter temple shall be greater than the former. Listen, the prophet is trying to say something bigger and greater and better than you have seen before is coming. It's coming. It's coming. Now, so the glory of this latter house is going to be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, says the Lord. Here in the city, when the temple returns, even the environment, the community, there will be influence. There will be a covering of God. God's glory in the temple will influence the whole city of Jerusalem. Praise God. Listen, the answer to restoring nations is the restoration of the church. When the church is restored, when the leaders take their position, when the unity and oneness of the body of Christ begins to be manifested, I tell you the truth, we should be an endeavor of everyone. In fact, the Bible says, endeavor to maintain and to keep the bond of peace. Praise God. And unity, unity bond of a peace and unity. Listen, it is our endeavor to ensure that the church becomes what ought to be. And each one of us has a role to play in this greater reconstruction and restoration to return the church to a place of great glory. Praise God. Listen, what God is doing in the church is, the, is going to be the thing that is a catalyst for the greater move in the nation. So, the latter glory. Somebody say the latter glory. Prophetically hear this. Prophetically hear this. In this time, we're not just going to have one move of God. We are going to have a convergence of ages. A convergence of moves of God. God is speaking a little of that which happened in history. He's speaking another little out of that which happened in history. And is combining all these moves in one last major move of God on the earth. This generation is the most privileged because of what's going to happen. Because of what's going to happen. Now, throw your mind behind if you are uh, one who is, has interest in history. Instead of the history of the nations, history of this nation. In the, the revival that hit Rwanda, came and crossed into Uganda, later crossed into Kenya. I remember 1996, we were preaching in Tharakani, the district. So, we were in uh, Chogoria, 
And we had a huge mission going on in the whole district. We had, I don't know how many centers, how many towns, but every town had a crusade at the same time. And on this particular Sunday, to launch the mission, we, do, we did two marches for Jesus in Chuka Town and Chogoria. So I was in the manning the Chogoria station on that Sunday afternoon. And we were having, all the churches came out Sunday afternoon and we picked some leaves and we were marching on the streets singing for Jesus to go and congregate in one particular place and then we can declare the mission has started and preach the gospel for a few minutes that afternoon. And then some of the people who were there, an old man said that today is exactly 50 years since the Tukutendrasa movement came to Chogoria. So we were there on a strategic day to celebrate kind of a jubilee 50 year in 1996. So that was therefore 50 years, 96 minus 50 is 46, right? So in 1946, so there was a move of God. Most of your grandfathers are the ones who are in those move if one of your families was in Christianity. And they believed in holiness and righteousness and testimony. Everybody had to walk in the light and show and share where you're coming from, what you're doing. You have to be a serious, radical Christian for Jesus. Testimony was a must. We want to know what's going on. We cannot hear an oiter of any sin and any confusion in your life. It was serious and thorough. So God is going to pick a part of that and restore it in this day. Because now, in the moves of God in the recent past with signs, wonders, and miracles, if you did not have the foundation, you will still be doing the miracles and doing strange things as a sinner. If you did not have a foundation of holiness, if God moves now and you have no foundation of holiness, we'll be hearing strange things. Then there were, you know, things of faith and the word of faith. You know, even to move the current church to the next level, we need faith, believing God. We're going to win nations. So the foundation of faith is also returning by God. A convergence of angels is coming. I pray that your prophetic eye and ear open now to hear what I'm saying and what the Holy Ghost is saying. Amen. So then we had a major move of the Holy Ghost and people baptized in the spirit with evidence of speaking tongues and people praying in the fire and the power. It has been lost now. We have so many people today in what is called the Pentecostal church. They don't know who the Holy Ghost is. It's our failure. The church has become strange. My God. In the 70s, there was such a move that the old church could not stand it. They chased most of these people out who are preaching. Now the people they are preaching to have gone back. You know, I slept very few hours because of this matter. I feel so strong in my spirit. Our generation, unless we return to God, to touch up kusababisha this generation to be religious. The glory departed. In this service, I'm sounding a prophetic word. May we return to God. May we return to God. I listened to one old man saying that time, they never used to lay hands on people. You just preach, pray, and demons begin to come out. And people are healed. Today, most of the pastors in the city cannot cast out a demon. We are in trouble. Real trouble. Ordinary believers were devil casters. Today, believers have demons. We are in deep trouble. So, Mimi Leo up and Makuja Kusema have come to say, May God do something, otherwise, we are wasting our time. We need God back in the church. We need God back in our lives. If there's going to be any glory. 
Amen. So, Jesus is transfigured. They see another Jesus. They had been with him. But now on this mountain, we don't know what has happened. He is somebody else now. Even voice from the sky is speaking to him at our hearing. This Jesus, this is another dimension of the transfigured Christ. We need to see Christ in a new way. That's what the Holy Ghost is saying. We need to see Christ in a new way. We need to see another dimension of the Lord. Peter was so mesmerized by this. He said, well, can we build some tabernacles, some booths? One for you. Look, one for Elijah and Moses. What does Moses and Elijah represent then? I believe this represents Moses was a man of the law. Elijah uh, of the what? Prophetic and all that. All these graces being merged now into Christ. So the old move and the other old move and another old move, they are all being summarized. That's why you cannot build a booth for them. Let them go back to the heavens. After this encounter, we are left with who? Jesus, who has the compounded, who has the, the last message, who is the image and the true representation of the God of glory right now. His gospel is called the gospel of the glory of God, the glorious gospel of Christ. So Jesus now shall be our pursuit, not a move of God, not another move. Whom we should be following is Christ, not his method, not what he did. It is him we need to be looking for. It is him we should be hungry for. If we are going to see a turnaround in our own personal lives, Jesus has to come at the center of it all. This generation has the songs, but has no reality. Time for reality is now. Time for reality is today. From this service, you're going, you and I are going to pursue Christ. The first lesson that Jesus trained his disciples in Matthew chapter 5. He said, blessed are the poor, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs in verse 3. He said, Let up, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for, the, uh, for they shall be filled. Look, the first thing we need to do is go back to hunger. The sense that we are bankrupt of God. We are poor. The fact that we have nothing, we are empty, we need to go back to God. We need to go back to God. We need to go back to God. Listen to Jeremiah. Go to Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 11. Has a nation changed its gods which are not gods but my people have changed their glory for what does not profit. Hmm. People are pursuing another type of glory. Usual nations are never supposed to change their God. But Israel changed from Jehovah God and went after other gods. And God is, is very, very, very concerned. He's very concerned. Verse 12, hear what happened. Be astonished, O heavens, at this. And be horribly afraid and be very desolate, says the Lord. God is even telling heavens, heaven here, let, let's be very worried, concerned over what's going on. We are afraid. A nation has changed her gods, I mean her God, to another glory, to another God. Uh, you know, we were supposed to be following Christ, not following church. We were supposed to be following Christ, not following religion. We were supposed to be passionate about him. We were supposed to be, to make him the very reason why we are here. But we picked other agendas. May God help us to return us. And we are going to return. I believe by the end of this service, at least in this kind of intercession that Abraham made for Sodom and Gomorrah, finally he said, if there are five righteous men, are you going to destroy? God said, no. I believe in life church this morning, at least five men, are going to catch up for the restoration five and above and five men here is, is both men and women praise God so I believe you should be one of them that is going to say I need to return from my backslidden state and return to God 
return from uh, what that makes the heaven so horribly afraid. The next verse says, For my people have committed two evils. What are the two evils? Number one, they have forsaken me. You see the capital M. They have forsaken me. So most people have forsaken God. Huh. Number two. Okay, that God they have forsaken is the fountain of the living waters. Number two, they have healed themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. You know what's a cistern? I used to be a plumber. You know me, I told you I was everything, right? Carpenter, plumber, mason, uh, economist, accountant, teacher. I was everything. God have mercy on the schools you went. So, broken cisterns. Cisterns is that thing that holds water in the ceiling. When it is broken, what is going to happen? It can't hold water. You have a total mess. The ground is soggy and bad. Total mess. So they have healed themselves systems with broken ones that hold no water. God is saying, this generation, we have to return to the fountain of the living waters. We have to connect to the real source of the real water, the living water. Not these other religious systems. They are broken. They can't contain nothing. Christ is the one I need. Somebody say Christ is the one I need. You remember the woman at the well. She, she needed to connect with the gift of God. Christ himself was to be the one to satisfy her hunger and her thirst. Are you listening to me? Now, so this is an evil. People have forsaken God. And God spoke through Jeremiah. Asking for a restoration. So that the original glory. God had intended to hit the earth. Listen. God has an intention. That in this year of 2016. And this, this our age. That there will be an invasion of his glory. In the city. And on the earth. And in the environment where we live. We are supposed to be carriers of that glory. That splendor. That majesty of God. That praise that comes to God. We ought to be the ones that cause him to be praised not become an embarrassment or shame that glory this glory is going to return in the next chapter Jeremiah becomes sharp go to chapter 3 verse 14 Jeremiah becomes sharp and he calls it what it is he doesn't call a spade uh, you know, a big spoon. He calls it what it says. He says, return, O backsliding children, says the Lord. For I am married you. I will take you, one from a city and two from a family, and I will bring you to Zion. God is telling Israel, look, you have left me. You are backslidden. You are no longer moving forward. You are degenerating. You are going down. You are losing your faith. You are losing your life. You are losing. Church, my God. Look at the church in the book of Acts. When you read the church in the Bible, we need that church back. We need the Bible church back. We need a Bible believing church. We don't have a Bible believing church. We have a strange animal called church today. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're going to have church back. Glory to God. So return. Two words. Return. The word return is the word for repentance. Praise God. I thank God for the message of repentance. Ah, we need to repent and return to God. It's a word turn. Re. Turn. In other words, turn again. Turn towards God. Oh, backsliding children. I know people don't like the word backsliding, but let me tell you. If you're not moving forward... And you're standing, you're actually losing. And you're quickly going down. May Jehovah restore the backsliding children. He says we need to come back to him. Come back to him, to him who married us. Do you see marriage right there? Do you see the covenant? The covenant. Israel had a covenant with God. That Israel is his wife, his bride. Praise God. We need to return to a relationship with God. How many of you can operate completely operate with a self-starting engine and self-running engine 
without necessarily being pushed, without necessarily being given announcements, without necessarily being called. Listen, today in the church, in this nation and elsewhere, prayer meetings are the worst meetings. Believers don't come. They, they have no need for it. They have no hunger for God. They, they cannot come for prayer. They will come for other things, uh, miracles and things for promotion and success because those ones will help them because of a self-centered Christianity that has caught up with this nation. But I'm standing here to, this afternoon to call for the, ori for the original church to return. A people that are hungry for God and that return is going to happen. God is going to raise a people, a remnant in our midst. It's going to happen. Thank you.